Ready for the big show, the top hog in New England, the scene in Los Angeles, the melons in Seattle. Want to know what to eat now? Ask a farmer. Show me some of those purple rain. Oh man, look at that. Gorgeous. That is a gorgeous looking egg. Well, it's a long day onion, so it needs to be planted really early, and then it takes its time, and then like any good Italian, they're just ornery. You want fruit that has seeds in it, like concords. Yeah, which those do well, right? The beer ate them all. No. Yeah, all the concords are gone. Oh. That one look good? Yeah. Okay. Picking the best, that's up next on Chefs of Field. Curtain up on the farm, the cast of several. Well, Hadley, George Schenk and farmer Hadley Gaylord's hogs in Vermont. Day. Chef Suzanne and surfer Phil take on Hollywood, California. Holly Smith and Andrew Stout outside Seattle. Greg Atkinson and Bill Taylor fetching oysters from Puget Sound. Farmers and chefs, chefs and farmers, harvesting and serving local, clean, organic, nutritious food. These are all people that have made more of it, more than simply producing, more than simply making a paycheck. Amazing. Yeah. Where do you grow them? Camarillo. Uh, I might even have another. OK. <laughs> no problem. Mm. Oh, that's good. Everywhere you go and on every part of the calendar, nature has something to offer. We've got pigs, you've got cows, and now we're in the greenhouse. This looks fantastic. Eat local, think seasonally, and you hardly ever know how good it will be. I like to know all of my purveyors. The more I get to know them, they get to know me, I get the best product for me. Knowing people like Andrew at Full Circle is a connection back down to the land, and that, as a cook, is humbling. That's really good. That's nice. That's really yeah. nice. In the great Pacific Northwest, the abundance continues. The offerings of the sea, the mountains, and the farm fields. Chef Holly Smith has two climate zones on either side of the Cascade Mountains to supply her Cafe Juanita near Seattle. Can you recommend or show me I need melons, I need, I need eggplant? I think Alvarez Farms just down the way is going to have a lot of that stuff. He's over in the Yakima County and um, I can okay. show you down here. Holly Smith also has farmer Andrew Stout of Full Circle Farms. You have a relationship with Alvarez Farms, right? You're kind of the uh, organic farmer magnet. <laughs> Alvarez Farms acts like our sister farm. They're over in Yakima where the weather's quite different. They're allowed to grow really delicious melons, beans, peas, corns, and peppers. So you can uh, take advantage of both climates and not have to be in both places at the same time. That's exactly that's, it. And it's exciting. You got so. to have some. This How's is so good. It's, it's perfect. Yeah. Hey, Eddie. Hey, Andy, how you doing? Eddie's the owner of uh, Hi, Eddie, Alvarez Farms. Hey, Eddie, how about you? Nice to meet you. Yeah, it works out well. You, too. you guys got first crop of eggplant yeah, this year. Yeah, we actually do have a lot of varieties of eggplant here. Eddie, but I love your stuff. I need some eggplant much. for caponata. Yeah. Is that OK? Right. We got here some Japanese and some purple oh, rain. Show me some of those purple rain. Oh, man, look at these beautiful, gorgeous. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous looking eggplant. Gorgeous you know? eggplant. Lovely. Just the really color. Love. That's beautiful. Very beautiful. It does look like purple rain. It huh? does, actually does. The name <laughs> Now, did you guys name those yourself? Or, uh... Yeah. We... <laughs> yeah, help that yourself to some of that. Thank you. You know, yeah. I love your farm. I, I, I think I've told you I've taken all your fresh chickpeas, and I'd yeah, like you they're to very plant good. more well, if you could. The season's very short on them, but we have them every year. Yeah, yeah. I think they're great. Yeah. Well, we love your product. We well, use it a lot. Thank you so. very much for shopping here. Oh, yeah, pleasure. thank you. We'll see you later, Eddie. All right, Andy. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Well, we got great melon from Alvarez Farms, and I just love prosciutto and melon. It's, it's, it couldn't be any more simple. I do have my own kind of way of serving it that is a little non-traditional, but as long as no one tells, I won't be in trouble. So what I'm gonna do is just clean out the center of that melon. It is so juicy. It's just incredibly ripe. I've already sliced my prosciutto, but all you need to do is get your favorite delicatessen uh, to slice prosciutto de parma as wafer thin as possible. My favorite way to serve the melon is just to give kind of nice scoops. Not too thick, not too thin. That way it really goes well with the prosciutto. And all that good juice, you might as well put it down on the plate. And then what we do at Cafe Juanita is just a little cayenne pepper. I really adore cayenne pepper. I did to just put it on the tips of my fingers and kind of fluff it out there. 
and then we'll bring over our prosciutto, as thin as you can get it. And, and I don't fuss about whether it's a full slice and it looks perfect. I mean, I would love that to happen every time. The most important thing is that it's wafer thin. Uh, it just melts in your mouth at that point and just lay it over your fruit. Anything works if you had figs, apricots, nectarines. It's really what's the ripest fruit during the summer. And it's a great, easy patio kind of dish. And then what I love to do again is to bring in our favorite extra virgin olive oil and do just a little bit of that on the plate. Any Italian would kill me for doing that, but it's, uh, it's a delicious bump up in flavor. So it makes it a little more like a salad. So this is Alvarez Farms ripe cantaloupe with prosciutto di parma. I always feel like whatever you cook should really draw you in to the time and place where you are. Greg Atkinson is a chef in the Seattle area, noted perhaps even more for his writings on food. I like the sense that the food didn't have to travel too far, but also there's that psychological link to the place and the time that only happens if the food makes sense. So this is where they grow up. Yeah, this is Totten Inlet. It's down in the south part of uh, Puget Sound. An oyster is named for the place where its seed originated. The Kumamotos from the islands off Japan, the Olympias from right here. Is that an Olympia? That's an Olympia. That's there. a real Olympia. Yeah. Our native oyster. It's a sweet oyster. This is, um, I always say this is a good beginner oyster. Yeah. For anybody that's not used to raw oysters, because it's sweet and it's relatively small, easier to eat maybe than the regular Pacific. As much as any food, the oyster's taste depends on freshness. But look at the size of these things and the shapes. I love the way it's like an abstract, you know, it's design. Got a right hook on it. Oh, they're beautiful. How to shuck an oyster? Carefully. Oh yeah, that's a pretty oyster. Yeah. One thing I love about oysters, aside from how they look and taste, each oyster is kind of like a little world in itself. You know, it has this uh, wonderful bowl on the bottom and a flat thing on the top. and they carry within that shell a little drop of the seawater where they once lived. There's something about an oyster that really does that job of connecting you with where you are and, and where it came from. This is one of those kumamotos that I gathered off the beach with Bill Taylor and uh, this kumamoto is a real user-friendly oyster. It's sweet, it's small, it's easy for people who are maybe not all that comfortable with oysters but it's also really fun for people who love oysters and uh, I am going to just shuck it and serve it with a really simple sauce called a mignonette. So uh, I think that I'll start by just demonstrating how to shuck one of these guys. I always protect my left hand with a towel, come at it with the oyster knife, go in just a little way around the, um, what I call the eye of the hurricane there. There's a hinge right at the connection slide the knife under and cut that abductor muscle. And then I come under the oyster once too and cut the abductor muscle there. I think kumamotos are especially nice for eating raw. This is one of those dishes that Julie Child might say, uh, that's not cooking, it's shopping. <laughs> We're really just uh, presenting the thing in as close to its natural state as we can. It's really not cooked at all, really simple preparation. So I'll shuck about a half a dozen of these kumamotos. You could also use Olympias, smaller Pacifics, um, even the Virginica. Any oyster that's uh, small enough to eat in a bite is gonna work well with a mignonette. Make sure that when you get your oysters, they're tightly closed. You don't want an oyster that's begun to open up. When you open the oyster, it should be plump and juicy, and it should have a fresh, clean smell like, like the sea, not any uh, off-putting odors at all. So you have a nice little half dozen there, and then you top them with this mignonette sauce that I'm about to make. And the mignonette sauce itself is made with fresh rhubarb juice. But all you need is a small amount of this juice, so one or two stalks is enough. It's got a nice color. 
Traditionally, a mignonette sauce is made with vinegar or lemon juice. What you're after is just something that's kind of tart. But I find that the fresh squeezed rhubarb juice has uh, really a pretty agreeable touch of acid to give oysters a little zip. Cutting these shallots into a dice. We just have some uh, chopped shallot, the rhubarb juice, and a grinding of fresh black pepper. We could serve this immediately, but I think it's even more fun if it's frozen. This one thing that's nice about oysters is to serve them very, very cold. So I'm just gonna pop this in the freezer until it's kind of a rhubarb slushy. So when it's frozen, um, I just need to break it up so that it's kind of soft and slushy. And I just want a tiny bit of this stuff on there to add a little color and interest to what's otherwise a perfect food already. Doesn't take much. You don't want to bury the thing in the mignonette. And the flavors are quite strong. The shallot, the rhubarb, the pepper. I gotta try one of these. What I'm missing in the beach, I uh, can hopefully make up for here with the mignonette. Oh, yeah. It all comes together there. People come from all over New England to this tiny barn in Waitsfield, Vermont, waiting two hours or more in the cold to eat American flatbread. Pizza is a wonderful platform for a whole variety of toppings. And probably the very best toppings that you can put onto a pizza are the toppings that are freshest of the season at that time. One of my great joys is have kids come in. We get an awful lot of kids. It's a real family-friendly uh, menu. And it's just great to have a format that is kid-friendly, but is also nutritious and good form and is being supportive of the community's agricultural base. This is an organically grown wheat that's milled into a white flour with restored wheat germ. It has a lot of the nutritional value that's so great about whole wheat, but the lightness and color and palatability of a classic white flour. The dough is much softer than would be typical for bread dough, and that helps in making it easier to stretch um, without having to crush it then gets a little spread of garlic oil. This is a mix of extra virgin olive oil and canola and fresh organic garlic. So what we've done is take this wonderful salmon that we get and we first marinated it and then roasted it in the clay oven and it just uh, retains its moisture and it's just uh, fantastic. It's marinated with a little bit of dill and hot peppers. This one is not going to have tomato sauce. What we try to do here is have specials um, and different toppings that relate to the season. We're constantly coming up with a variety of toppings which helps with a very narrow menu because we don't offer a lot of things. So we try to offer very traditional pizzas like the homemade sausage um, and tomato sauce and cheese and that kind of thing, but we also branch out and have these more eclectic toppings that reflect more closely the seasons of the year. Um, so that's asparagus and that was also roasted in the clay oven with a little and this is the fresh sorrel. They're very simple but each of the elements is elegant and has wonderful flavors in and of itself so that you don't have to get too too crazy about uh, lots of complex combinations. And I'm going to finish it with just a little bit of hard cheese. I think that the home chef can improve their cooking greatly through their intention by consciously choosing foods that have integrity, um, that have a more local or regional source, um, that are cleaner. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating about better, cleaner, organic, or sustainable foods is that they're very often criticized as being more expensive and therefore out of reach. But in fact, what I find is that because their flavors tend to be far richer, that we can use less of them. We can actually serve ourselves less food at the same cost and have a cleaner cuisine and in the, in the process be supporting local and regional agriculture. 
So during the course of the baking, I have to rotate the flat bread several times. And the breads uh, bake at 750 to 800 degrees or so. Uh, they take typically about eight minutes. Okay, that is ready. Oh boy, you can smell the salmon. All of the different flavors um, and aromas are really just coming out. And part of the deal is not to overwhelm the flatbread with any particular one flavor. I love slicing this in random sizes because during the course of the eating, uh, sometimes you want a piece that's got a higher ratio of crust to toppings, and sometimes you want lots and lots of toppings. Sometimes towards the end of the meal, you want a little bit, just that last little sliver. And if they're all of the same size, then you don't have that choice. I think one of the distinctions of flatbread is that it's really about the crust, it's about the bread. Once we have this just wonderful crust, that then we can use that as a platform for local and regional toppings. Um, and it, it, that creates the flavors and the complexities that end up being more nutritious and just more fun to eat. We made good bread today. In the average supermarket, produce has traveled 1,300 miles or more to get to the shelf. At a farmer's market, the very hands that have picked the beans and plucked the strawberries then put them in your hand. It's so much more inspiring to see where some, to know where something comes from. And also, you get these really beautiful sort of heirloom products. Chef Suzanne's famed restaurants are Luke and AOC, both in Hollywood, not far from the scene at the farmer's market. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Thank you. Nice to see you. I don't have any of that broccoli today for Why? you. Why? Because I sold out already. No. We have to wait till Wednesday. Wednesday? I'll have some okay. For you. Why is it so good? Well, it's an old Italian broccoli that dates from the 1500s, and it's actually been propagated since uh, Catherine de' Medici's day. Wow. When she took it to France, when she married the future king of France at 14, oh my God. she took two things with her, her broccoli and her high heel shoes. Oh my God. What and else does a girl need? She was the hottest thing in France, right. let me tell you. Well, when you're four foot two, you need high heels. Right, and broccoli, probably. Yeah. And I you have, have our name on the broccoli for Wednesday, right? Yes, I know, right? you're okay. on number one. Okay, good. You're number one with a bullet, are, baby. Yes, exactly. All right. Okay, well, darling. Will you say hi to John? I will. Okay. It wasn't too many generations ago that this was the way everyone bought food. It wasn't too long ago that everyone had a farm nearby. Phil McGrath's farm is on the foggy California coast just north of Los Angeles. I want to see the gigantic squash everybody's talking about. Okay. The monster Let's find squash. Those. Oh, here we go. This is a good example. Oh my god. Yes. <laughs> Big daddy. And a little baby. Aww. So I had this wonderful customer last year ask me if I needed anything when she was going to Israel. She said she saw that squash that I'd been selling for 10 years. Uh, in Israel, oh and God. I said, hey, if you can bring the seeds back, that's great. I originally brought the seeds back from Morocco, uh, Marrakesh. So and you made up calling them Moroccan squash. Well, that's where the parent right. was from. Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I did. Um, and I've been growing them, so it's nice to have the true seed again. So you have tasted it yet or not yet? Um, I, no, I haven't. You just I, cut into and it. These, I can tell that the leaves are still green. Uh -huh. When the leaves really start to droop and die like this, then it's time to cut them. Okay. Yeah, right. this is still green enough here where I, I know they're not ready yet. It's all about just watching the plant. Let's go look at the strawberries yeah. real quick. Oh, and the heirloom tomatoes. Okay. This is a really cool time of year in uh, Southern California because we are really lucky with the seasons that they all kind of extend. And this is late summer, but we sort of start getting early fall stuff, but we still have summer stuff. I'm gonna make a warm uh, dandelion salad with uh, kabocha squash, bacon, and um, toasted pecans. Kabocha squash is like one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things. It's a um, Japanese winter squash. It's a little gnarly looking. It's got some uh, disfigurement here. But um, actually, a farmer once told me that, um, you know, whenever you see these kind of weird things, or like in melons, when you see those weird, like um, kind of webbing, uh, it actually means that like the bees have gotten into it and that, that means it must be the most delicious one in the field. So you kind of always, sometimes ugly is good. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to peel it and roast it. So I'm first going to take the seeds out. If you were really industrious, you could save them and toast them. 
And we actually, um, a lot of times when we're doing things with squash, we'll use toasted pumpkin seeds as a garnish. It's kind of a nice cycle. You want to get rid of the green, most of the green. The nice thing about using, you can use a knife, but the nice thing about a peeler is it kind of preserves the shape of the squash. Then I'm going to cut it into wedges. I mean, one of the things when you're cooking with really sort of beautiful product is you want to maintain sort of the integrity. And the last thing I would want to do is like dice this up because part of what's so pretty about it is the natural shape. So I'm just going to toss it with a little olive oil, salt, pepper, my old friend, Mr. Thyme. I put thyme in everything just so. Toss it around. And then we're just going to lay it on a sheet pan or cookie sheet. We want to bake it in a hot oven. I do it about 450 because you want um, to get nice color. And again, if you cook it too slowly, that's when the, the squash can kind of start to just sort of break down. This is um, slab bacon from Nyman Ranch. There's sort of this new great trend in, with pork and other meats too in um, producing the meat uh, without antibiotics and sort of like the old school way. So the animals are not confined and there's no antibiotics or hormones used so that they, the idea is that healthy Healthy animals are better for you and also taste better. I'm going to put some bacon in here. Meanwhile, I'm going to get my lettuces together. This is some dandelion that we got from McGrath Farms. Uh, it's unusual to see it so small. It's a little bit bitter. I personally like bitter flavor. When we're making the salad, we sort of have the bitterness in mind, and that's why we're working with the sweetness of the kabocha squash. The little acid from the um, sherry vinegar will help cut it, and the bacon, like the richness and the saltiness of the bacon, and then the crunch of the nuts will all work with that bitter flavor. This is a treviso, which is an, sort of like an elongated radicchio that Phil's been um, just starting to grow. And um, the, out, the outside leaves are pretty bitter, but then just work towards the inside ones for the nice tender leaves. Sherry vinegar is what we're going to use for the acid in this. It's not too acidic. It's not as, as harsh to me sometimes as red wine vinegar, and it's not as sweet as balsamic. So it's, it's a really nice in-between vinegar. I really like it. We're going to use that in some really good olive oil. I like my bacon not too, not too cooked. I like it when it's like crispy on the outside, but it still has some chew. And I'm going to add um, a little shallot. Just to sort of take the edge off it. It's not really cooked, but just sort of wilted. A little olive oil. I'm going to do a little sherry vinegar in here. And move kind of quickly so it doesn't all get, uh, it doesn't all evaporate. We can adjust a little bit once we have it in the bowl and we can taste it. You want it to just sort of wilt the greens. They're not cooked, but they're just sort of warmed. To assemble the salad, I, I actually like to really layer salads together so you don't just get one bite of squash or one guided bite of dandelion. Each bite has like all of those elements that you're looking for. So we're going to put a little of the dandelion and the um, treviso down. A couple of our pieces of squash. So I cook the squash, you know, toss it in the olive oil and cooked it in that hot oven for about 20, 25 minutes. This is just some um, Pecan, scatter those over the top, and that's it. It's a warm dandelion salad with uh, kabocha squash, bacon, and toasted pecans. The farmer's reward is a gift to the diner. The diner's reward is straight from Mother Nature.